Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's video introduces the second unit of our studies, which is focusing on conflict versus cooperation. So as we go through this unit here, our big question is going to be under what conditions can two parties play nice with one another, even if there is nothing guaranteeing that they're going to be nice, like a police. So the temptation kind of looks like this. If we walk away from the international realm for a moment here, in many circumstances, people have incentive to be mean to one another. So for example, if your roommate just leaves $20 sitting out, there's a lot of incentive for you to take that $20 and pocket it because, hey, that's $20. That can buy you a lot of stuff. Domestically speaking, though, if you live in a good country, laws make it really easy for you to resist this temptation. So if you steal something like the $20 that your roommate sets out, you go to jail or the police do something just generally bad to you. And this fear of the police doing something bad to you means that you don't want to steal the $20 because the consequences of your actions don't make it worth that minor gain, that temptation you have from taking that $20 bill. But when we look into a world of international relations, remember we have this bad thing called anarchy where we don't have a world police and we as a world cannot just make laws to force two states to, to be nice and cooperate with one another. And so this leads to a very interesting question and one that we're going to be focusing broadly in this unit on. And that's, is cooperation impossible under these circumstances? Or, but differently, under what conditions will states want to cooperate with one another even though there's nothing enforcing that cooperation except for their own future behavior perhaps? we'll see that we can actually get to a causal mechanism that explains why states actually cooperate with each other a majority of the time rather than always just constantly being in conflict with one another and constantly being in war. So the outline for the unit is going to look something like this. There's going to be three main things we're going to be talking about. So the first question is, how can individually rational behavior lead to collectively bad outcomes? If two states are just going to interact one time and that's it, how does this sabotage cooperation? And we're going to use the prisoner's dilemma to get to that. If you haven't seen the prisoner's dilemma before, it's a very simple game, and we'll see it actually in the next video. Then we're going to build on from just that one interaction. So in practice, states interact with each other quite a bit, right? We don't go away. States just don't disappear overnight, in, at least in general. Sometimes they do. But there is definitely a shadow of future interaction at work. And so what happens if instead of just trying to play nice with each other today, states are trying to play nice with each other today and also tomorrow and next week and next year? How does a shadow of future interaction induce two states to, to cooperate? And what we're going to see is that it actually can't as long as the states know when the interaction is going to end. Essentially, the states can see forward into the future and know that at the end of their interaction, they have all the reason and all the incentive to not play nice with one another. And so this future conflictual relationship sabotages cooperation in the present. But then we'll get to the third point, which is that if the future is never ending, if two states don't actually know and can't see when their interaction is going to end, then there is no future conflict which is going to sabotage cooperation today. And what we'll actually be able to get to is cooperation continually throughout an infinite horizon where the two states are just going to continue cooperating with one another as long as they don't know when the end of the interaction is going to be. Now, this has many IR applications, and it's a great way of just thinking generally about the world. So... We're going to talk about, over the course of this unit, the cult of the offensive and the origins of World War I. We talked about that briefly in the video on proximate versus underlying explanations or causes, and we're going to delve more into that in a couple of videos from now. We're going to talk about tariffs and free trade policy. So tariffs are just import taxes on goods that are made overseas and brought into another country. And we're going to talk about why there is incentive to have these sorts of tariffs, but why we've also instituted free trade policy, at least for the most part globally, and why states are actually willing to get along and institute this free trade policy. We'll talk about arms races versus arm, and arms treaties, I should say. So arms races, that's something that I'm sure you've heard of before. It's when two states just continually pile up more and more arms because they're scared of the other state. Yet, in practice, we see a lot of arms treaties where states are not doing that to one another. They're not actually building their arms up. So why are these arms treaties made? Why do they actually get held up over the long term? Remembering, of course, that a treaty is just a piece of paper, and there's nothing actually enforcing that other than the states behaving in the way they want to, because they actually want to follow the treaty. And then finally, we'll talk about the evolution of cooperation, which is a very famous book, and especially its application to trench warfare in World War I. So in World War I, giving you a further preview of what the cult of the offensive is, 
in World War One or during the time at World War One, military planners and uh, political leaders believed that the offense had the advantage in World War One, and so this this essentially sabotage negotiations because everyone was really worried about the other party gaining a quick little first strike advantage on them. But when the states actually got out onto the trenches, they found out very quickly that the trench warfare or the warfare technology of the time favored the defensive heavily. And so what actually ended up happening in these trenches is a fair degree of cooperation where parties on both sides, so one army on one side, one army on another side, weren't actually fighting with one another. They were actually trying not to kill each other. And so we'll talk about how that started and how it became reasonable for these guys to not shoot at each other, even though they're supposed to be at war with one another. And that is going to be what we're going to do in this this unit. So that, that's all we're going to be talking about. And starting with the next video, we'll actually get to doing some modeling. We will talk about the prisoner's dilemma and then from there start applying it to these international relations applications. So I hope you join me in the next video and I will see you then. Bye.